Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Radley Balco, an investigative journalist and reporter at The Washington Post. He currently writes and edits The Watch, and he's the author of 2013's Rise of the Warrior Cop, The Militarization of America's Police Forces, and Tucker Carrington, the director of the George C. Cochran Innocence Project at the University of Mississippi Law School. He worked as a criminal defense lawyer his entire legal career, most of it as a public defender in Washington. Welcome to Free Thoughts, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Your new book has the interesting title of The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist, A True Story of Injustice in the American South. So we'll start with The Cadaver King. Who is The Cadaver King? So The Cadaver King is uh, Stephen Hain, who uh, for about 20 years did about 75 to 80 percent of the autopsies in the state of Mississippi. How how many would that be? That's uh, somewhere between 1,500 and uh, a couple years he topped 2,000. Uh, And this is all by himself from from a morgue, a private morgue, uh, while holding down two full-time jobs and testifying in court three to five times a week. The uh, professional guidelines say you should do more than 250 in a year. If you do more than 325, you can't get certified. So this is you know, way beyond uh, what anyone has ever done before. And so there's just, uh, with this guy, there were just some some quality issues uh, and just there's just no possible way you can do that many autopsies and do them in the way that they ought to be done. Uh, on top of that, then there were lots of other problems with uh, the testimony that he gave in court. Basically, it was a system that was set up for someone to dominate who could appease the prosecutors, sheriffs, the uh, elected coroners, police chiefs, uh, and so, the, yeah, the cadaver king is, is Dr. Hain, uh, and he was basically dominated the autopsy and death investigation system down there in and, and Mississippi and parts of Louisiana for, for the better part of two decades. And the country dentist. The country dentist is a colleague of Dr. West, um, excuse me, of Dr. Haynes by the name of Michael West, who um, was a clinical dentist in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, South Mississippi, uh, and also a coroner for Forest County, which is the, the county of which Hattiesburg is, is the county seat. And at some point in the late 80s, early 90s, he and Dr. Hain uh, crossed paths and became friends. And um, Dr. West um, had had a, an interest in um, and some professional experience in the discipline of bite mark matching, specifically um, matching alleged bite marks often on victims with the dentition of a suspect uh, in an assault or generally a murder case. Um, they started working together and essentially solving cases, difficult cases, often, as I said, homicide cases. Over that period of time that Riley mentioned, this two-decade period roughly, um, Dr. West not only um, sort of pushed that particular discipline to its outermost limits, he invented aspects of the discipline that he named after himself, but he also became an expert in other disciplines, tool mark matching disciplines, um, video enhancement fingernail scratch matching, the list goes on. But um, they were colleagues. They worked together both in the morgue, and then they frequently testified together in trials at Mississippi. Now, I've seen my fair share of CSI, and if it's at all accurate, then this stuff is real science. This is actual. I mean, it's true that your teeth are unique, right? So it would have, wouldn't a bite mark be unique? And at least in theory, it doesn't sound totally ridiculous. Or, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's totally ridiculous. Yeah. So bite mark matching uh, in particular. So it rests on two underlying premises. The first is that all of our, we, we all have unique dentition, that's, uh, our, our bite, the pattern we make when we bite something is unique to us and, and to no one else. Um, and that's, there's just no science to back that up. And the fact of science that has been done, uh, the actual scientific research that has been done suggests that it isn't true. Um, the second is that human skin is capable of recording that uniqueness in a way and preserving it in a way that's uh, useful, that's useful for identifying people. Um, well, the first pre- premise isn't even true. But if it were, uh, human skin, uh, the second premise is even less true. Skin is, uh, our skin is fungible, it's malleable, it, it, it's rubbery. Um, you know, depending on how you're bitten, uh, you know, whether it's an overbite or an underbite, whether the, the, the victim is sort of pulling away so the teeth are dragging through the skin instead of into it, um, what happens to the body afterward? Um, in the case that we write about in the book, in one of the two cases, uh, two main cases, uh, the, the little girl who was murdered, um, her body was submerged in water for hours and then it was embalmed. 
Uh, so, you know, Dr. West and, and other bite mark experts claim that they can find these really minute, intricate details in, in, your, in a bite and in skin, including uh, what West calls bunching, which is this idea that when you bite down into human skin, these tiny little uh, crevices in the back of your teeth sort of collect skin and push it down, and that somehow that can be preserved by human skin. Not only can that be preserved by human skin, but he can then take an impression of your teeth and find the crevices that match to the bunching in the, in the bite mark. It's all absurd. Um, it, it's, there's, there's nothing about it that suggests that you can uh, record and match details down to, uh, to that level. Um, the, the CSI thing is interesting because a lot of the people who complain about what they call the CSI effect are usually prosecutors more than defense attorneys. And what prosecutors complain about is that shows like CSI condition jurors to want experts to give them sort of matter of fact conclusions. They do, and, you know, when you have an actual scientist on the witness stand, they tend to speak in probabilities. They tend to kind of hedge what they say. They don't say this person did it, as, as Dr. West would often say, indeed and without a doubt. Um, they they speak much more um, uh, with a lot more caution, uh, and jurors don't like that. Jurors like certainty, and so when you get somebody like Dr. West who is willing to speak with that kind of certainty, they can do a lot of damage. How is the relationship? You kind of mentioned it with the p- prosecutor and the police, and and we could talk about you know either the Levon Brooks case or the Kennedy Brewer case, the two you write about, but. Why why are the, the forensic investigators like, like Dr. West or their coroners, medical examiners like Dr. Hain, how do they get pushed toward the suspects that are identified by the cops? Because there were a bunch of suspects in these cases, but suddenly they got pushed to the ones that they were focusing on. That's a that's a good question, and I think it's um, it's it's a difficult one to answer with a single with a single answer because it depends on the fact individual facts of of the cases. Um, but in 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 many, if not most, of the cases um, that I've been dealing with and that we write about in the book, the the suspect, the main suspect, in one way or another was clearly made known to either Dr. West or Dr. Hain. I mean, there was no there was no um, um, uh, effort to to disguise, uh, to, you know, to sort of keep keep Doctor West blind or Doctor has uh, Doctor Hain blind to who it was. Um, it, it, you can see it in reports. Um, they often knew who the main suspect was, and so um, uh, Doctor West frequently said, "Well, I, he he said I've, I've exonerated many more people than I've ever included." And if you go back and actually unpack that statement um, in the LeVon Brooks case, for example, there were a number of suspects, 12 or 13, 14, something like that. Um, but he knew um, who the main suspect was, LeVon Brooks. And so his quote unquote exonerating the other 12 or 13 really sort of didn't amount to much because uh, he knew who the main suspect was and that was who he matched the teeth to. Um, one case we write about in the book, which I think is illustrative, is this uh, serial murder case in Florida that uh, early on in Dr. West's career, he went over to um, Tallahassee. Is that right, Riley? Is that where it was? Gainesville. Gainesville, sorry. And and was asked to sort of work his magic um, uh, there. And he ended up coming out empty-handed. And in the book, I, I think what we say, what we believe is that the reason he came out empty-handed is because that was a case where they hadn't arrested anybody. And they really didn't have any idea who this it ended up being a serial murder was. So there was no way... Uh, either advertently or inadvertently, for the police to 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 give West a name, they didn't have anybody, and so he he after a week or so of uh, investigation and his work in his forensics, he had nothing to offer. But I think it stands in sort of counterpoint to these other cases where he did know uh, the main suspect and sure enough ratified the police's uh, hunches. Uh, yeah, I would just add in the LeVon Brooks case, uh, one of the people that West uh, exonerated was the person who actually committed the crime. Um, he was one of the original suspects, uh, and but you know by the time uh, he was sent to West uh, to take uh, dental molds of his teeth, uh, the police had already focused on Brooks, and so West was able to clear this guy. Um, and he actually probably would have cleared, should have cleared him anyway, because the mites, the bites on the little girl weren't actually human bite marks; uh, they were most likely insect bites. Yeah, that's the thing that shocks me in a lot of these cases. Is it, it, I'm a little surprised at how often apparently people bite. 
who they're assaulting, right? I mean, especially in East Mississippi, that's a, that's a, a disproportionate amount of people biting. Uh, that's that's actually one uh, in one of the earlier versions of the book. One of our ti- one of the chapter titles was something like an epidemic of uh, of biting like, criminals. Uh, <laughs> yeah, aggravated biting or something yeah. like that. Because suddenly West appears in Mississippi, and now everybody's biting each other. It's, it's a miraculous sort of coincidence. You write in the book that uh, the entire system that helped convict Brooks and uh, and Brewer and other untold people um, is part of a, quote, structural racism built into the criminal justice system. Now, a lot of people, especially conservatives, balk at that, uh, even the term structural racism, because they don't really, I think it seems almost too conspiratorial that, that there's just a bunch of Bull Connors walking around and being like, let's get those guys. But you mean something a little bit more longstanding and, and almost insidious in its own way. Right, uh, you know, I think the thing about structural, I think it's a, a misunderstood term. Um, I, there was a couple, there are a couple cr- conservative criminologists, which aren't, aren't aren't many of, wrote a law review article a, a, a while back that said, you know, um, that they don't buy structural racism because it implies that everybody in the criminal justice system is is racist, and that's just not not believable. Well, that's not, that's actually not what structural racism is. Structural racism is the idea that the system itself, that the architecture of the system, the structure of the system, was is racist. And you know, if you think about when a lot of our institutions were were built and when they were honed and when they were refined, it was during the Jim Crow era, and they were built specific for a very specific purpose, which was, and it's a very popular term now, but it was certainly true then to to uphold white supremacy, uh, and that's you know certainly the case with the death investigation system. And so in the book, we go back into. Uh, the civil rights era, the Jim Crow era, we talk about how the death investigation system was used to cover up lynchings, to sweep them under the table. Uh, how it was used to basically facilitate the inability to prosecute uh, people for civil rights assassinations. Uh, and so the context for structural racism is that you can actually have a system that is structurally racist, even if none of the people in that system are personally bigoted or personally racist. It's it's uh, that. It's that architecture, uh, that that lingering architecture, that uh, that causes the problem. That, that was one of the things that was really fascinating to me when it, when these cases first happened. <clears throat> My office came in late. We we had just opened basically. The Innocence Project in New York had done uh, not only all the groundwork, but basically all the legal work to um, to get these folks exonerated. And uh, you know, I was I was very interested in the cases even after the exonerations, and I, I won't go into the weeds too far. But but one of the things I looked into was the jury composition, and um, the jurors were a mix of blacks and white folks, and that and this is a part of Mississippi which was which was super isolated. It it doesn't get a lot of publicity, you know, when you talk about the civil rights era, but it was it was rough. It was rough on black folks down there. And there was a, I remember there was a, if, I, if memory serves, there was a 90-year-old African-American woman on, I think it was Kennedy Brewer's jury. She was deceased by the time I got involved in the case. But I assume, I could be wrong, but I assume that her journey to get on that jury was an extraordinary journey for, for an African-American Absolutely, woman. Absolutely, yeah. And, and uh, I, I can't imagine that she was racist um, I mean, I'm making some assumptions, but I think they're they're safe. And likewise, there were some white folks on there, a couple of whom we know, um, who are, are not racist at all. Um, and and yet, the verdict in that case, within the criminal justice system, was as bad. One could argue, or as we sort of sometimes say, worse even because it was condoned by. So this wasn't a, a lynching that took place outside in the dead of night. All of this took place inside of a courtroom uh, with judges, African American lawyers, African American jurors, African American law enforcement, and you end up, however, with with the same sort of baseline injustice. I think that's what Riley. And let's talk about too. The I mean, the victims in this case weren't just Levon and Kennedy. I mean, if they had, if the system had gotten the right person the first time around, we co- probably could have prevented the rape and murder of the second little girl, who you know was also black. And and so the system, you know, the system that was the problem. With the system is is it's pliable. It's it's malleable to those to the people who are in power. Um, it it serves them. And it serves them whether it's a backwater sheriff, racist sheriff, like you know, a Bull Connor type, or it serves them if it's just a, a an aggressive prosecutor who wants his hunches confirmed or just doesn't really want to do the groundwork or has tunnel vision. Um, either way, uh, but the victims again, you know, tend to be low income people, tend and tend to be disproportionately black. It seems that Mississippi's 
death investigation system was particularly problematic for a very long time. I think it was until 1986, I think is the year, coroners still had to round up livestock, right. which says something about the history of that office. But, but, but there weren't many requirements for coroners. And you have a stat that in 1977, nearly half of reported deaths were attributed to unknown causes, which seems like a bad way of discovering murder. And, but cops might like it because it seems like your murder rate is pretty, pretty low, which kind of goes into the feedback mechanisms there. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It was a, it was an antiquated system, and again, it was designed to keep the people in power happy. Now, whether that means um, you keep your uh, unsolved case rate low by just not finding as many murders, so there are few murders to solve, uh, or if it means you know uh, finding uh, murders and uh, getting you know. Uh, the people that they immediately sort of suspect uh, the closure and, rate, basically. Yeah, the closure rate, right? Um, again, none of those outcomes are about justice. None of those outcomes are about promoting and protecting public safety. Uh, they're about making sure that the people who hold the right offices uh, are sort of content with the system. Now, as you alluded to at the beginning, Radley, the vacuum essentially that was created by the inadequate death investigation system in Mississippi was filled by. Stephen Hayne, it seemingly, but he had a bunch of fans in the judicial, prosecutorial, and police worlds because he, he got their man. Is that a fair assessment? Or or wouldn't get their man. I mean, we, there's a case that didn't make the book we, that I've, I talk about quite frequently, it seems, uh, but this was in Sun, Sunflower County and an elderly woman who was found uh, a poor, you know, low-income black elderly woman who was found in her home with blood all over the walls and the neighbor had seen... Uh, somebody running from the house with a bloody T-shirt, uh, and Hayne determined that she died of a stroke. Uh, and you know, her family sent the the body to a coroner, a uh, medical examiner in Alabama, who basically determined that she'd been murdered. You know, it's about getting the right guy, but in some cases, it's about if the person isn't deemed all that important, and the prosecutor, or the local sheriff, police department don't, doesn't want to deal with it. Um, you know, sometimes that the system could uh, make cases go away as well. Uh, but, you know, we talk about this in the book. If it wasn't Hayne, it would have been somebody else. I mean, the system was designed uh, – and I'll, you know, since we're, we're, this is a libertarian podcast, I'll point out, I think, you know, this was basically a privatized system. It was just a privatized system where the incentives were misaligned, deliberately so, uh, but they were aligned in a way that – uh, the incentive was for uh, the medical examiner to tell prosecutors and police what they wanted to hear instead of telling them you know, what they needed to hear. Yeah, I think one other quick point is is that he was the only game in town. You know, the medical examiner's office was vacant, separate and apart from from whatever the motivation may have been for prosecutors. Say, you know, if if they had a homicide in their in their district that they needed to prosecute, um, Doctor Hain was the person they needed. He was the he was the only person that was doing the autopsies. He was the pathologist, um, and I've had prosecutors say to me, you know, look, um, I understand what you're saying. There were these cases, but you have to understand my position too, which was I had to prosecute these cases, and and that was the only option I had because the state had not fulfilled its its obligation to um, to staff up the medical examiner's office for two decades. And again, this is about making everybody in power happy. So by not funding the office, the legislature's happy because they can use that money for other things. Things. They they don't have to, you know, budget uh, for a state medical examiner, which you know should have been making hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, plus had a couple of assistants and a fully you know staffed office. Legislature doesn't have to fund that. Um, and instead, what was happening is the counties were paying for each individual autopsy, um, which you know it ended, ended up costing the state more as a whole. Uh, but because it was being done in this kind of localized way, that costs were were more sort of diffused across the state. It was harder to tell exactly how much the state of Mississippi was paying. Now, Dr. Hain and Dr. West are doctors. I mean, they, they do have training, mm -hmm. certification. I would assume they there there are forensic boards and there are forensic societies and then did they get certified by this uh, these associations well I'll talk about um, uh, dr. West first yes uh, he was certified by uh, the American Board of Forensic Odontology in fact he was a diplomate so he was sort of in the upper echelon as it were of this organization one of the fascinating and he was for years he ultimately got sanctioned and and um, resigned. Uh, from from that organization, but one of the interesting things that happened in the early 2000s, and this is a long story that I'll make short, is that he was retained um, to look into a case, 
and to see whether or not he could match a, a dentition to a photograph from an actual, it was an actual bite mark. from well, that, that just seems absurd on its face all the time. Matching it to a photograph, it, it, it even compounds everything you said about skin. Right. Uh, now, now match a dent teeth to a photograph of skin, but continue. Well, what was interesting about it was um, he, he in fact made the match and two things. One is um, the, the, the dentition was from a complete, it was from a random person, had nothing whatsoever to do with the bite mark in the it was photograph. A, it was a sting operation, basically. Oh, yeah. It was a, uh, and, and so he was wrong. It's about a 22 minute, he videotaped, it's about a 22 minute videotape and it's, it's impressive. And he followed the then existing best practices uh, that were set out by the American Board of Forensic Odontology. So strictly speaking, um, he did nothing sort of scientifically, and I'm making quotation air quotes uh, uh, on the radio, but um, uh, he followed procedures and ended up being, he couldn't have been more wrong. And that's fascinating. I think it, it, it's, it's such a window into um, the, the unsound aspects of the discipline. People knew about this, um, and yet, you know, he continued, he did too, obviously. He, he continued to testify for years afterwards, even after, you know, making that kind of mistake. I'll talk about Dr. Hain. Um, Dr. Hain was, uh, did have his medical license uh, and was, was properly board certified in um, clinical and anatomical pathology. And so that's, uh, that's when you are looking at a patient, a dead patient, to see sort of what illness killed them, uh, uh, you know, whether it was, you know, cancer or disease or bacterial infection or whatever. Um, he was not ever properly certified in forensic pathology, which is basically the, the, the uh, examining of bodies after death when there's a crime or some sort of suspicious death, you know, due to uh, negligence or, or homicide. Um, he took the exam by the American Board of Pathology in forensic pathology, which is what you would do to get properly certified uh, in the late 80s and failed it. Uh, he claimed for 20 years that uh, he didn't really fail it so much as walked out in protest because there are questions that he found offensive. Uh, one of the questions was he said uh, he could only come up with one when asked, you know, what questions did you find offensive? And uh, he said it was this question that had asked him to rank colors in, their or in order of their association with death. And he just was furious and just stormed out. Um, there are always problems with that story. One is he had, it, I think it cost like $1,500 to take the test. He had flown to Chicago to take it. The idea that you're going to walk out over one question is sort of absurd. Um, but uh, we've well, the um, Innocence Project in New York, I believe, eventually got a copy of the test itself, and that question actually never appeared on it. Um, what he did do, though, is over the years, he would repeatedly claim in court that he was board certified in forensic pathology, and he would cite uh, two organizations, uh, one of which no longer exists. Uh, the other uh, is, and both of them actually meet this mis this definition or this uh, description, which is uh, they're sort of. Uh, certification mills. You give them a resume and a check, uh, and they send you your certification. Uh, one of them is sort of notoriously uh, 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 clownish, I guess is a good word for it. Um, the, there was a woman who sort of got her cat certified to this group. There was a convicted uh, murderer who, uh, or attempted murderer, I guess, who got himself uh, certified from prison. Um, there was a, a journalism student who got herself certified in uh, uh, forensic, uh, I think it was called forensic medicine at the time. Uh, and this is a group that uh, has thousands and thousands of members, but uh, it was a started by a guy, kind of a careful, care, uh, colorful guy who, Robert O. Block, uh, actually recently died, um, but who uh, was a poli sci professor who had been fired for plagiarism uh, and then sort of started his own handwriting analysis group, which then expanded and sort of became this massive organization. Uh, but the problem is it sounded, the, the it sounded very much like the official organization. And so when Hain would say I'm certified by this group in court, uh, for judges and jurors and prosecutors and def even defense lawyers a lot of the time, uh, they didn't really bother to check to make sure that this was the right organization. Um, and even when they did, even when the defense attorney did bring it up, uh, judges usually just went ahead and said, oh, it's fine because we've certified him so many other times before. Now, that, that's the, the weird thing here. So what, what are judges doing? I mean, aren't they supposed to keep unscientific evidence out of the court. And, and it seems like none of this stuff would meet science because they're all matching. So you mentioned like fingernail and bite mark and blood splatter. And it's all subjective. It's all subjective. It, I, I, I use the term feng shui because it's kind of like that where it's like, well, this is really good feng shui. And then the next feng shui artist is like, this is horrible feng shui. And there's no actual test for that. Um, but what are judges doing in this situation to 
determine that this is not science. It's just a, a guy's opinion about this mark on the body, or worse, but <laughs> at least that. You know, it, that's a good question too, but there, and I think my answer would be there's a host of things that judges are and aren't doing. Um, one, just to go back to the certification. I mean, certification, in my view, is is sort of the bare minimum. I mean, you need to be certified, presumably, by some governing board. But, you know, uh, uh, whether it's a certification mill or whether it's even a legitimate sort of gold standard um, uh, only means so much. You know, you have something you can put on your wall. What you're, what you're testifying to and the basis for that is, is the critical question, not whether you're certified, um, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of terrific physicians out there. Some are far better than others. They, they may have gone to the same school. Um, so ultimately, it comes down to sort of what is the expert saying and what is the basis for that, the basis for that. Um, so my, my first answer is sometimes the certifications seem to be uh, the entree or not for the testimony. If you're certified, you can testify. Um, the other thing is that, and we discuss this uh, at, uh, at some length in the book, but I think it's it's really interesting. Judges tend often to look at precedent. So rather than uh, engaging in a sort of um, um, uh, you know granular observation of what this particular expert plans to say and the bases for it, which, by the way, is often the job of the advocates, the prosecutor and the defense attorney to, to sort of educate the court about you know, uh, um, uh, this, this material. The court um, will just look at the discipline, bite mark, for instance, and say, well, I, I don't know why we're having this argument. The state of California has admitted bite mark evidence since the late 1970s, and there are 25 other jurisdictions uh, around the country that have admitted it. Therefore, uh, we're just wasting our time here. This is admissible, which at some level, I think, for lay people sounds correct, right? Why, why are we wasting our judicial resources and et cetera, arguing over something that's been argued in a bunch of jur jurisdictions before, and they've come to this same conclusion? Well, it's not a waste of time because, it, again, it depends on who the expert is and what the expert is saying. And it also just because you know West Virginia or California may have admitted a certain expert to say a certain thing doesn't necessarily follow that the state of Mississippi, for example, in this district should allow Dr. West to testify to whatever he's testifying to. But nonetheless, judges feel safe because they have this precedent that they can rely on. That's another issue. I think you used the term judicial echo chamber in the book that, that they just it, – it, when did it start? I mean, was it bite mark – is there a sort of point zero? You talk about Salem Witch trials in the book, but but in terms of modern bite mark analysis, is there like a point zero and then everything just – you know, you can follow it like a game of telephone all the way back to it? Yeah. So Tucker mentioned this uh, California case and ironically, it's called Marx, uh, M-A-R-X. Uh, and that case is kind of the jumping off point and you see uh, – you know, the interesting thing about that case is that the, the California appeals court in that case actually ruled that it, it wasn't scientific, that bite mark analysis wasn't a scientific discipline. But uh, they said uh, it just seemed right. You know, it, it just it's just common sense. Uh, I think Tucker in a law review article called it the, the eyeball test. Uh, and so that set the precedent. And then what's, what's crazy, though, is you look at these uh, subsequent appeals court decisions all over the country, and they refer back to Marx, and a good percentage of them refer back to Marx as having established the scientific legitimacy of bite mark evidence. And it didn't. It did, did the opposite. It said there was no science here. Um, and so they've just, judges have just done a really bad job at this. And, and you know what? It's not at all surprising because judges aren't trained to do scientific analysis. They're trained to do a legal analysis, and they're doing a legal analysis exactly how you expect them to, which is by looking at precedent and looking at the controlling case law. That's how you do a legal analysis. Um, the idea that judges, uh, you know, are bad at scientific analysis shouldn't surprise us any more than, you know, the judges are probably bad at coming up with a game plan for an NFL game, right? For an NFL team, um, we're asking them to do something that's well outside their job description, and they're doing predictably poorly at it. The, you know, the problem is that the consequences are pretty dire. If you let me just add one one thing, if you do legal research, you know, if you're a law clerk in a judge's chambers, and the judge says, "Hey," Uh, is 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 bite mark testimony admissible? So you get on Westlaw or Lexis as the clerk, and you look up is bite mark testimony admissible? You know a host of cases will come up, and uh, if if the judge says give me the jurisdictions, and if you went to Mississippi, Levon Brooks 
and Kennedy Brewer's cases will come up, and they both still to this day stand for the proposition that bite mark testimony is admissible. There's nothing in in the um, affirmances, right? They were prior to the exonerations. There's nothing in the affirmances, affirmances which say that later in 2008, Brooks and Brewer were exonerated. They never bit anybody. They weren't involved. In fact, no one was bitten. Um, and so, you know, you would you would think that those cases were good precedential value. They're not. They're, they should be highlighted as as the exact opposite. In fact, in three states, at least three states, I think it may be four now, um, the, the controlling case law for whether or not bite mark evidence is admissible uh, was a case where an appeals court upheld a conviction in in the process of ruling that bite mark evidence is admissible uh, and that person was later exonerated by DNA testing, you know, completely exonerated, found to be innocent. Uh, and yet it's still the controlling case law when we look at whether or not bite mark evidence should be admit, admitted in future cases. It seems that there's an epidemic. I mean, I, I will use the word epidemic and you can tell me I'm right, of, of forensic malfeasance that kind of across the country. And some people have been pointing this out. It seemed about 2009, you started having National Academy of Sciences saying this is not science, and then the President Obama had a report that said it's not it's not science. I mean, we're talking about the matching stuff, not the DNA so much, but the, the matching subjective stuff. And is this having any effect? I mean, is the, is the growing awareness, at least for people like us and, and people who do these commissions, that this is not science and so many bad convictions are caused by this, is it having an effect on courts? Um, not, not to the extent that you think it, you would think it would. Um, you know, DNA evidence has exposed a lot of these fields for being sort of a lot more subjective and error prone than we than than a lot of people thought they were. Uh, and the courts have still been really reluctant uh, to address that. And again, this is because courts, our system values precedent and it values um, you know sort of the past and it values um, uh, the finality of, of verdicts. Uh, you know, to protect the integrity of the system. Um, or the, at least the appearance of the integrity of the system. Um, that might be a better way. Of, yeah, the, right. Yeah. right. Um, but you know, you talk about an epidemic of forensic malfeasance. There, there is a lot of malfeasance uh, in the form of, of bad actors. Uh, there's Annie Dukin in, in Massachusetts, the uh, who was faking drug test results, and uh, tens of thousands of cases were overturned. There's West uh, and and Hain, who you know, at some point, I don't think even they believed their own testimony. Um, there, there are lots of examples of, of forensic analysts who were clearly uh, faking it, who were clearly frauds. But there's also just a lot of examples of just bias creeping in the system. And part of the problem is that we've just done a really poor job of structuring these systems in a way that incentivizes just outcomes. Um, you know, Roger Koppel, uh, the political scientist, uh, did a study a few years ago that was jaw-dropping. I mean, it should have been a national scandal. He found that in, uh, I can't even remember how many states, but I think it's a dozen or more, uh, the crime labs are paid per conviction. Uh, so if you're a crime lab analyst and your analysis uh, basically you know, exonerates the suspect, uh, you don't get any money. Uh, your lab doesn't get any money. If you, on the other hand, find the evidence that uh, you know, ends up with with a conviction. The suspect is in charge a crime lab fee that goes back to the lab. I mean, that is not a system that you know puts a value on a just outcome as opposed to a particular outcome, which is a guilty verdict. Uh, you know, other crime labs report to prosecutors, or they report to the state police. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, several years ago, there was a uh, the newspaper uh, reported. You know, the the handbook for the lab talked about you know, referring to defense witnesses as horrors and in talking about how you can police prosecutors and prosecutors did their year end reviews and decide whether they got raises and promotions. And there was a security video that the paper found of these two blood spatter analysts. Blood spatter is another very questionable field. Wait, but, Dexter's ro- not true? That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> where, they, where the two analysts, though, they, they continue to do the, the, the experiment over and over again until they get the result that the prosecutor wants, at which point they high five one another on the video. Um, so, you know, it's not, I don't think you need people who are deliberately sort of of uh, faking results uh, to get to where we are right now. I think it's it's a system that we've just put uh, the incentives in the wrong place and we, we valued the wrong sort of principles. I think one thing that's interesting that I've seen this phenomenon is, is in Mississippi, uh, you would be hard pressed to get bite mark evidence into a, a trial court in Mississippi now. I think, you know, the, the story about Dr. West, there's been enough cases where, where prosecutors, defense attorneys and judges pr- wouldn't let that happen. 
That said, um, I, I'm on a listserv uh, of defenders, and I see this frequently. Someone will say, uh, the prosecution has a blood spatter expert. And then the reflexive question asked is, does anyone know of a good blood spatter expert for me? Which endorses when, the entire exactly, thing. Yeah. Exactly. Where the question really should be, you know, if anyone's been reading the reports that, that you mentioned, should be, uh, I wonder if blood spatter is like bite marks. You know, is this stuff all it's cracked up to be? Maybe, maybe what I need is not a blood spatter expert, right, but someone who can come in and explain why blood spatter is not a sound forensic science to begin with. But so to, to your question, yes, it, it has made some difference uh, in certain, in certain phen- uh, cases where we know that the discipline is nonsense. On the other hand, there is still this sort of default um, reflexive um, attitude, you know, reaction by folks, which, well, I mean, blood spatters come in and for the last 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever, I've had, I've had blood spatter cases. There's no way I'm going to convince this judge, right, that this stuff is nonsense now. I mean, what's, what's this judge going to say? I was wrong for all these years. I need my own expert. I will say this too. You know, the, the, you're, if you're a defense attorney, sometimes you're in a, uh, you know, a hell of a predicament here because if you, you know, let's say it's a bite mark case, if you hire your own bite mark expert who then testifies in court, I mean, I've seen the opinions later when you try to challenge the legitimacy of bite marks uh, in your appeal or in your post-conviction petition, appeals court will say, hey, you put your on your own expert, you bought into it, you know, you can't challenge the legitimacy, the, the legitimacy of it now. Now, I think you should be able to, but I've seen opinions where they've told them they can't. Uh, and so you're in this difficult choice where it's like, do I do, do the sort of right thing and the rational thing and the sort of enlightened thing? And actually the professionally ethical thing, arguably. Yeah, uh, which is yeah, and which is to go after this just as a legitimate f- field of forensics in the first place, uh, or do I just hire my own expert and hope that you know my my expert is more charismatic and persuasive than Dr. West? Um, I wanted to get back to your thing. You said how the courts are handling this. So in some areas of forensics, like shaken baby syndrome, the courts have have, have started um, uh, looking at old convictions even without DNA. But I think in the vast majority, of this, particularly in the pattern matching fields. Um, these more subjective areas of forensics, uh, the courts just have not responded to the scientific community at all. And in fact, to this day, every time someone has challenged bite mark evidence in court, they've lost. So not a single court in the country has said that bite mark evidence is, is illegitimate at this point. Where are Dr. Hain and Dr. West now? Dr. Hain, they're both still in Mississippi. Dr. Hain um, is no longer performing autopsies for the state of Mississippi, which he did on a contractual basis for a couple decades. But he does work privately. Um, and a few years ago, not too long after the state uh, didn't um, uh, re-up his contract, he um, started doing private autopsy, excuse me, private testifying and autopsy work um, and testifies not infrequently uh, for defense attorneys in criminal cases now. Um, Dr. West, um, last time I checked, last time I was with him in a deposition, is a still practicing clinical dentist, but he practices in a prison He's a prison uh, clinical dentist in South Mississippi and, um, as far as I know, has not testified to bite mark matching. Says he wouldn't, by the way. Um, he no longer believes in it. Um, he hasn't testified for some years. We'll say, though, that the state of Mississippi is still defending convictions, one, uh, certainly on West's testimony, but in several cases, they're still defending con- con- excuse me, Haynes' testimony, but in several cases, also West's testimony. Which I think underscores the point you made about that the inputs into the system and the incentives involved that they just keep defending what they did in the past. Yeah, and we said this in the book. I mean, it would be a huge thing for a Mississippi judge, particularly somebody who's been in Mississippi all his professional life, to say, you know what, Dr. Hain is an incredible uh, witness and we need to like face up to this. In some cases, the judge may have been a former prosecutor who used Hain, so it would be calling his own sort of prior career into question, but also it would just be calling into question the integrity of the very system that this person has worked in their entire life and, and, and you know, presumably believes in. Uh, and that's a lot. I mean, I, I hope one of them does it at some point, and I think when a judge does it, that judge will, will be a hero. Um, but it's it's a hell of a lot to ask of a judge. Um, we, I think we definitely need to, to admit to that. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.